So this is where we need to harness the data. Um, I call that mi micro segments. Exactly. Which is what you ha you might have five or six personas. Hi, I'm Matt, your host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive ROI from their investments in CX and culture together. I'm really excited to be here today with uh, Ken. Ken is a professor at Babson, which is ranked number one for entrepreneurs for more than 25 years, and he teaches consumer behavior there. So we both share a really strong interest in why people do what they do and how that connects to customer behavior. Thanks for joining us today, Ken. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be speaking to you again. And I, I should also emphasize, um, besides his role as a professor, you know, Ken has a wealth of experience working at companies like Amazon, American Express, Fidelity, SAP. So he's got a um, real, really great combination of, um, of, of teaching and practical experience working on these topics. Just to um, get us started, uh, Ken, you know, in the class you teach on consumer behavior at Babson, um, what are what are some of the key shifts you've seen in consumer behavior um, that companies should pay attention to as they build winning CX strategies? So, Matt, consumer behavior, and I, I want to quickly add, um, consumer behavior, when I took it in graduate school, is the course that made me decide to want to be a marketing person. So I don't know if I should thank my professor for that or, or admonish him for it, but... Uh, it is near and dear to my heart, and I've been teaching it at Babson at the graduate level for 12 years. And there are two parts of consumer behavior. One is an evergreen part in terms of, to your point, understanding customers, understanding their behaviors. And then the second piece is, well, how is that manifesting today with the things going on? And I would think, you know, relative to as we think about CX, there are really two big umbrellas here within consumer behavior. One is perception in that consumers are going to derive meaning based on what's going on around them. And that's going to overlay a lot of the way they look at customer experience. I'll talk more about some specifics there. The second is the context. I got something here in a certain way. I want to now get it from you in the, in the same way, et cetera, et cetera. Even though it may be a completely different product, a completely different, as we would like to think about it, inside a company industry and so on. But these are two overriding issues. And they really play out in a couple of ways. The first is this idea of immediacy. Big shift we've seen over time, and it didn't happen overnight, it's been growing, 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 is consumers' want of immediacy. Immediate delivery, immediate feedback, immediate response to my question. You know, if I, if I get, can have food delivered to my house in 30 minutes, why can't I get XYZ delivered in 30 minutes, or if I could download this and it only takes 45 seconds, why do I have to wait for two days and so on and so forth? So consumers, from a contextual point of view, are being conditioned around immediacy and raising that bar to what they want it to be, which is also extreme personalization. I don't want to get the same meal Matt got because that's what's on the menu. I want my meal. I want it prepared the way I want it. I want it delivered the way I want it. I want it at a certain temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So this level of extreme personalization done in an immediate manner. And a lot of this also drives back to the idea of knowing me. So consumers have implicitly allowed businesses to collect data on them, know them, and so on. And part of that bargain is that, okay, well, you're going to have that data which means you know me better, which means you shouldn't be wasting my time with things I'm not interested in. You should know I like these types of shoes or this type of an experience, and you should only be feeding me those. So as marketers now, we're sitting in a space where consumers are even more demanding than ever, not just based on what they want from our business, but based on what they're seeing out there and pushing that into our business, right? So no longer can I say, relative to, say, car dealerships, I might be better than the guy down the block. I need to be thinking about how does my car dealership interact with consumers based on what their expectations of that experience are, period, end of story, not just compared to other car dealerships, compared to the universe of people interacting with them. So those are a lot of the kind of in the consumer mind situation. You know, one of the tenets, Matt, again, about 
that you and I share about thinking about behavior is internal to companies using consumer behavior ideas is the idea of segmentation. That, you know, we want to craft journeys. And yes, we might personalize journeys, but we need to understand customer segments so we can understand, well, this set of customers are my elite customers and I want to treat them a certain way during the journey. And these other customers, they're just trying me out. So their journey might be slightly different with different um, iterations and so on. And while this is not something um, driving the consumer behavior side of it into the company, it is the company using consumer behavior principles such as segmentation to drive the experience out as to what they want it to be. You know, one thing we share an interest in is in, in um, and funny that you mentioned your interest in consumer behavior in your class. I, um, I, I actually see my own personal journey as one where I started thinking about, you know, am I going to study philosophy, political science, economics? And I was really interested in like why people really do what they do. And I got encouraged to go into economics and business because of that. Cause like philosophy and political, I'm not, would, would be a horrible theoreticians cause I care what the people really do. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I followed that journey, really being fascinated with, uh, you know, the growth of behavioral economics and the growth of, you know, consumer behavior, particularly how you square this, um, the, the importance of emotion and understanding unconscious thought versus rational thinking, because you need both to be successful. And, and you know this better than anyone in the consumer behavior field. You know, how do you strike this balance between understanding the rational and the analytical side of, of analyzing behavior versus really understanding the emotions and the unconscious, which is uh, a lot harder to unpack, but there are ways to do it. And it actually does drive more than half of what people do. I'd love to get your thoughts about, you know, in consumer behavior, how some of the advances in understanding unconscious thought and emotion have impacted the way we think about not just um, you know um, understanding behavior, but how we segment and 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 drive um, you know different actions based on that. As in a kind of broad brush way, I think we are moving, or I should say, there's there's uh, data that shows we're moving to more of the emotional decision making, even with things like large economic purchases like homes, right? And this is something you could say, someone, well, 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 if I'm buying a house, I'm going to do all the research on the um, the school and, and what the, uh, the values the involved have, purchase, right? A very involved purchase. Yet that whole purchase journey may have started with an emotion or likely started with an emotional decision as to these neighborhoods, not those for reasons of where I want to raise my kids. Uh, nostalgia. That's two neighborhoods over from where I grew up or whatever, whatever. So even what people consider a, an involved decision, which brings economic factors and people are doing trade-off analyses, has the emotional pieces within it. And we see that on the consumer side in terms of even when you're looking at things like uh, durables, like washers and dryers, Right, things that at one point in time were just these big white machines. They were priced a certain amount, and people went to Sears and they bought them. Now there's such a design element to these things that people are making decisions on two separate machines that maybe do exactly the same thing, but because of the design and these other aesthetic pieces, are appealing to the emotional side of things, and in fact pulling people in. So we're seeing this on the consumer side becoming deeper and deeper. And through the use of social media, it's much easier for people to be, I would like to say gathering input, but in fact, more being bombarded with input, if I'm looking for a washer dryer, that's going to be calling out features and functions beyond the basics, right? And using that as the way to differentiate. But we're also seeing it, Matt, and you may be finding this as well with some of your clients. People have always assumed business to business is the rational thinking. You know, business to business buyers just buy economically. There's a piece of that. But let's not forget two things. Number one, back to the earlier point, business to business buyers also live as consumers when they leave the office or these days sit at home and act as consumers as well. They are not immune to the emotional approaches. They are not immune to the relationship building and 
you know, as, as one CMO I worked for said so well, glass buildings don't buy our software. People do. You work with people, not companies. Exactly. Companies are made up of people. Exactly. But appealing to those people emotionally, right? And there are various, from a B2B marketing point of view, various ways we could do that. It may be less the design type of emotional discussion we're having with the washers, dryers, and more the fear-based discussion as to if we don't make this change, X, Y, Z will happen. Or the opposite of that, if I do X, Y, Z, that's going to be really good for us. I think people, um, it's worth unpacking this for a little bit. It's more intuitive in consumer markets what, where emotion and unconscious thought comes to play. Because you know what you could say is, what's the meaning that goes beyond the kind of beyond the product experience? Whether it's, you know, I talk about this in my book, The CX and Culture Connection, when I talk about this idea of the experience collage, where you, you know, where you can get beyond the product um, is one axis on a, the experience collage canvas. You go from product usage to, which is a usage experience, to a meaningful experience, which is beyond the product. And you're tapping into the way this product and this brand fits in your life. And for the brand to have a category insight, and to understand your meaning further, they can connect with you on a much deeper emotional level. And if you go from individual experience to a shared experience, you can get to true community around the brand, which is even deeper meaning. But that, that's more intuitive, and you can do all of the deep metaphor solicitation and unconscious thought analysis to really understand. And by the way, that's what makes things common across personas, not different across personas, is this meaning. You still want to get at what differences are, but it's the the brand is actually defined by what's common across a cluster of personas versus what's different across many personas. Um, and that's very intuitive with consumer markets. When you get to the business to business side, as you're saying, you're still dealing with people. So with where, where I think this shows up more often than not is when their pain points and ease of doing business is, is impacted you start to see the emotions come into play about where ease of business, ease of doing business or trust is eroded. Or if a business is trying to generate expert, demonstrate expertise and build trust, that also has an emotional angle about how you build the relationship strength and how you demonstrate your expertise and build trust around it. You can start measuring and poking into, you know, like, how am I doing on building trust? How am I doing on overcoming barriers to ease of use? And that gets that emotion, but you have to work a little bit harder to uncover those emotional connections, but they're there. Exactly. And there was some interesting research, uh, I guess about four or five years ago, I think IDC had done it, where they looked at generational buying in B2B, right? So Gen X relative to the tail end of boomers and looking at things such as building trust, such as looking at, in some of the things you and I both talk about a lot, journeys and so on, how the Gen X generation used a lot more of the electronic means for the journey to gather just basic information. But at the end of the day, they still depended on the trust, the salesperson, the um, the guarantees of service, et cetera, et cetera, in the same way the previous group did. However, the previous group, having not grown up with social media and such, was much more salesperson dependent earlier in the cycle. But they both ended up in the same place in terms of, more or less, the idea that there needs to be that trust bond. And that very often, was through a salesperson or some type of individual representing a company, representing what it stood for, representing how they were going to stand behind this and ensuring success, for lack of a better word. To build on what you're saying is there's connection between the behavior in the organization of your people and the brand. So the way that your people show up with the customer along the journey actually reinforces or erodes the brand promise. And the brand promise is not going to be successful if it doesn't tap into emotion too. If it's purely rational and you don't articulate the emotions you want and then the behaviors you want of your employees to reinforce that, 
and then actually train for that and, re- and reinforce habit building of these behaviors. It's not enough to have a consumer insight about what you want the experience to be. But if you don't translate that to behaviors of employees, then all you're doing is automating or building a website or building digital assets. And that, that actually will not get you there with a great experience. It's important, but the human behavior is actually what's most critical to scale customer experience, not just digital digitization of the experience. Exactly. and Especially I, in B2B. I do think that's a, a phenomenal insight, Matt, because I do believe many businesses, through no fault of theirs, they're trying to stumble their way through until they find a good person like yourself or me to help them, they think digitization is the experience. It's like, no, 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 that's a delivery mechanism. The experience is how are you connecting what you're promising, right? What is that brand promise we're trying to make and how are you connecting that? And, you know, um, at AWS, sitting with hardcore B2B companies that are in fields like manufacturing, you would never think, and in fact, the conversation starts, I'm not sure why customer experience might be important to me, but we get into these issues. And right away, you see you see a softening. You see people melt a little bit like, oh, I get it now. I see why that matters. I, I, I see why, even though I don't work directly with consumers, but I work with distributors or wholesalers, why this matters. It's like, yes, we're trying to take what you've built here and bring that promise out in a way that's going to be received. Well, and you can you can make the connection to business value. You know, if we're able to drive these behaviors in the organization that deliver the experience we want, what would the outcome be? You know, and and that actually allows you to create measurement over time, where you can you can work on your training and behavior adoption, and then measure whether that shows up in your voice the customer surveys. If you get specific about the behaviors you want to show up, you can actually see whether they're showing up in the experience, particularly if you have call centers or emails with customers or video meetings with customers. Now there are more modern approaches to listen. You can actually mine the um, experience data and not just, and, uh, and connect it with other operational data. But you can do that in ways that don't rely just on a survey. You can put in the survey too, but I, I find it's much more powerful in the call center and the emails and the video to start mining this data than just trying to squeeze it more questions into your survey. And there's a bit of survey fatigue out there as well. So I would much rather see the unconscious acts. I'd rather see when people are doing things because it's what they're doing as opposed to them being watched, right? The Hawthorne principle of we're watching them, so they're going to act a certain way. I mean, I did have the benefit, um, you know, in my career at one point, working with someone who was a tremendous ethnographer. And we would do these types of field uh, surveys, if you will, where we'd go out and we'd watch how people did things. And very often, and this was uh, both B2B and B2C, very often, particularly with consumers, it's all very unconscious. They do things. Then we, in some cases, we'd ask them some questions. We'd walk up to them and we'd say, um, you know, how do you think about this? And what they would say would not be consistent with the way they acted. Because the mind says one thing the unconscious mind has them doing something else. Well, you know, the uh, one of my favorite quotes from Yogi Berra is you observe a lot by watching, <laughs> which, you know, is really, it's very insightful for people like us who like ethnography and like observational research, because sometimes you're better off watching someone than asking them a question to see what they really do. Right. Exactly. Whether it's in person in a store environment or a hospital or hotel or on a website, you can still watch them. You know, right now, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, when you look at the tech stack for customer listening, what it often combines is like customer listening data with surveys and text analytics, mining open things like social media, ratings and reviews, messaging. All There's like 10 to 1 unstructured versus structured but also like a video playback of the website experience. So you can actually, platforms like Quantum, right? You can actually see how people are engaging in the experience. And and if you combine that kind of ability to listen to the data, look at the additional data signals of like 
what's operational data that shows up in Salesforce and Adobe and SAP and Microsoft and other systems combined with this ability to replay the experience and see what people actually did. You can do a lots of continuous learning to see what's really going on in the experience. And what I think you and I have just talked about that I think is makes it a hundred times more valuable is if you have a lot more intention about what you're listening for. So if you really start to understand the meaning more and you start to understand the behavior more, then you can listen to see. And with AI now, you can actually score on attributes that align to those elements of your brand promise. But with that, in the past, you you couldn't. There was just too much noise. You couldn't listen to all this. But now the models make it a lot easier to synthesize the data. So you, Matt, write a lot about the connection between CX and the organization. And I think what you're underscoring here are two mind shifts that need to happen. Number one, as marketing people, well, let's just say customer people, but marketing people, it is kind of in the DNA to put things out. We build campaigns. We write, we write ads. We, we push, push, push. And we need to pivot more to listening. And I'm using that term broadly, listening. The listening could be watching, could be looking at more data. It could be even old school focus groups or ethnography and things like that. Marketers need to listen more. And I don't want to say do less, but certainly be less focused on the pushing. So that's one piece. The second shift related to that is, um, and I also, um, you know, I grew up in analytics, um, in, in marketing functions where we had heavy analytics, I had the benefit of being at American Express early on when they were starting to use analytics around customers. And I also you know, teach some of that at, at uh, Babson, but the view that people take on analytics is, okay, just get all the data and let's see what the data tells us. And the, often have to caution people, you don't want to do that because also today there's just way too much data. You're just going to drown. You're never going to find anything. You're going to spend months and see nothing. There needs to be, to use your word, intentionality. What is it you're trying to understand? Now, that doesn't mean we want to bias the data or, or, or just seek out the nuggets that support our hypothesis and bring that in. But we need to be intentional in what we're trying to do. And this pivot, so the marketing pivot to listening and the analytic pivot of it's not about tools. It's not about, you know, those are important enablers. It's about how are we approaching the questions and going to have the data help inform us? Some of it might validate. Some of it might say our hypotheses are wrong. You still need hypotheses to underscore that word. What's my belief about why something is true? And can I then prove that with data and experiment and iterate? But what's happening now is there used to be a cycle where you would build insights then you would do a campaign and activate against it. And then you would analyze post-event to see, you know, measurement and see what happened. And there was a lot of energy that went into building better insights, whether that was a category insight, um, an insight for an ad campaign, an insight for a product launch, an insight for shopper marketing. There were very specific insights you would build where people optimized on that and did research. And then they would do something at scale. And we were limited by, you know, how, you know, it's expensive and time consuming to launch something at retail. You don't want to do it many ways. You know, you don't want to make it up as you go or launching an ad campaign or launching a website. So what we ended up with is this long cycle time with a lot of effort and insights. We were optimizing for scale of execution. And then the measurement would be something with a long lag time. Like, could you, you know, now you talked about immediacy. People want real-time insights as opposed to four to six weeks was considered good in the past. Now that's considered really slow, right? Now what's happening is that cycle, it's spinning much faster. We're able to do this much faster and actually get with AI much more real-time insight in a campaign. But that doesn't mean you throw out this idea of having hypotheses or having things to test. What it means is you can just get, you can do many more iterations and, and try many more. You can try more things faster, not that you still don't have intention of what you're trying to learn, right? Otherwise, you just waste a lot of energy. 
And I don't know about you, Matt, but I do not see in a lot of organizations a good understanding of experimentation. Well, first of all, in many cases, I don't want to say not an interest, but sometimes they feel the risk is too high, personally, for someone to be experimenting on something. But I don't see a lot of understanding of how testing works and what we're trying to understand. And are these sample groups too small sometimes? And are we drawing conclusions in the wrong place? So I do think, while AI, to your point, is just revving this motor and kicking off more, it is more important than ever that we have discipline around what is my hypothesis? What am I trying to learn here? Because it's not just about the doing, it's about the learning. Because the learning is going to lead to better doing next time. And um, I'm not seeing as much of that as I would like to see. The idea of understanding a feedback loop and understanding how to create experiments and make them work. This is um, why I'm so fascinated, Ken, with culture and organization effectiveness. You know, like I, I started out in, um, in my career, I was lucky to do work on digital with um, you know retailers and consumer good companies when the internet was new, so I learned about you know how to leverage digital for e-commerce and analytics with a lot of leading companies. But a lot of that was actually how do you change the way you work with your agencies? How do you organize differently? How do you evolve your culture? It's not just technology and analytics. A lot of it is around people and how they work to take advantage of these things. And then I brought in that aperture from consumer retail to working with healthcare and financial services and, and, and B2B companies. And it also brought in from digital to customer experience from all the reasons we talked about. You can't have impact unless you focus on the whole experience, not just digital. So I really enjoy that. And with a lot of these um, experiences, what I've learned is the, it's ultimately about alignment and organizational effectiveness around how do you drive decision making and, and get the organization to frame things the right way, to hold the frame so they're not constantly bouncing around, and then to, to build a muscle in the organization to test and learn with data in a way that it's not overly complicated so you can actually create conviction to act on the results. If you make it too complicated, you can't drive change. Exactly. And you know, use the term there, building the muscle. As we know, Building muscle isn't going to the gym once. It's going every day, repeating it, perhaps changing it from time to time. But it is about, to your point, conviction. It's about commitment. And, you know, I'm sure with, me, with uh, all of your clients, you talk about how this needs to start at the top and how people need to tell these stories. They need to tell customer stories. They need to talk about, we tried this and it didn't work. But here's what we learned. Right, it, because that's reinforcing the hypothesis and trying things and testing things, and talking about customers and what we're about. Um, because I'm, I'm with you. You know, we could draw out on paper a beautiful experience and a journey, and so on. The rubber meets the road in the organization. And as someone who's had large organizations underneath me, I know that it's. It's more than that afterthought of, oh, yeah, let's just give it to these people to do it. It is really getting minds and hearts behind what it is we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, in fact, when people say to me, you know, how, how do we become customer centric? I say, well, let's start with your recruiting. Are you getting the right type of people that want to be thinking about customers? Or am I getting a bunch of people and not that there's anything wrong with them, but they focus on something else. They, they don't like to think about customers. They like to think about the way we manufacture it or so, so on and so forth. Yeah, I'd like to encourage the audience to um, to like and subscribe to the podcast and um, also just remind people that, you know, if you go to cxandcultureconnection.com, you'll see all the podcast episodes. And some of the things that Ken's talking about here, I would point you to um, not only some of the things that we were talking about earlier around unconscious thought with people like Luke Carbone, uh, that I've talked to, um, but also some of the things he's talking about, about decision-making and about how you use insights and how you drive the better, best use of data. Um, check out the um, uh, podcast with Christopher Frank and Oda Netzer around decisions, decision-making. And we talked about decisions over decimals. It's about decision-making, not volume of data. 
And there's a lot of parallels to what Ken's saying in that other podcast. And I, I hope you'll, um, you'll, you'll take the time to subscribe and, and go check out some of these other podcasts. And if you want to chat with further with, uh, with Ken and me, we'd be happy to have a conversation either together or, or separately. We, we really enjoy, enjoy that. Um, so I guess Ken, to, to build on this, um, you know, there's one fertile area here around like, how do we make the insights stronger and more meaningful? And where, where do some of the limitations of how people use personas, how can those evolve to make better use of insights? That'd be one area we could explore. And another would be how you make them actionable. Like, so it's not enough to have personas as a creative exercise that's qualitative, but how do you actually translate this into something you can experiment against and actually measure the impact on customer behavior? Let's start with the first part of it. And I'll come back to the other. How do you see the way people are building insights and using personas evolving now that we have you know, both a deeper understanding of the unconscious and on the flip side of that, so much more data? Those are like, and at the first glance, you say those are contradictory, but they're highly complementary. So how do you see personas evolving in your practice? So I am seeing, in a practical sense, less people evolving them. They're like, oh, we got a persona. It is done. Here it is. Here's who this person is, and here's who that person is. How I do see it evolving, though, is the persona needs to be an archetype, which, to your point, how do we bring in data to now really fill this out, really think about the dimensions of this customer? So I might have a certain persona, which if I have a certain product set or experience set I want to bring to them would be very different than if I just took them straight on at face value of who they are, what they buy, et cetera, et cetera. So to your point, this is where we need to harness the data and take it from being a persona, which is very useful. In thinking about an experience in a broad sense, very useful in thinking about products and services we may want to develop, and now personalize it. Now get it down to the level, okay, but what's going to make sense for Matt in this situation? What's going to make sense for Ken, who also fits that persona? So we might fit the same persona, but we may be going down different paths. So this is where we need to harness the data. Um, I call that mi micro segments. Exactly. Which is, you, ha you might have five or six personas or more that you focus on for your design work and getting people aligned. But then w rather than grow from five personas to 500 personas, you can, you can micro segment within a persona and say, based on this data, we're going to personalize it further for this persona using the data. So right. the data allows you to thin slice it and create micro segments. You don't throw personas out the window and just say, oh, we'll just use emergent segmentation with 500 or 1,000 personas. That's not actionable as an organization exactly. to, to, to build strategy. Right. We're not going to fill, build 500,000 know, products based on that. Um, mm -hmm. So no, I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement there. And the one thing I would add is as you think about personas, you're thinking about lifetime value as well, or you should be. This persona represents you know, X amount of our business or could represent Y. As you get into the micro, here is a place to do some crossing in terms of how customers actually stack up in either their current lifetime value or their potential lifetime value. Because again, Matt and I might be sitting in the same persona, yet Matt may have proven himself to be high lifetime value customers, so we're going to handle treatment a certain way. Ken is kind of in the middle. He can go either way. While he sits in that persona for a number of reasons, attitudes, uh, certain products, certain interests, it's unclear the level of loyalty we're going to have from him. Right, so we're going to want to treat him differently. So now we get back to Matt. Some of the points you brought up in terms of how do we make decisions as to what happens, what are the hypotheses, and how are we going to deliver the data in the right way to be able to make those decisions and also execute on how we bring that to market. Which brings us to the other side of the question, which is how do you activate and drive continuous experimentation against your personas? Well, what often happens is companies use these as a design tool, and then it's disconnected from any actionable segmentation. Anything they do, it's purely qualitative. I, I actually think it's really important when you build a persona that you have a way of finding that person in your audiences. If you can't actually find the persona, it's not actionable. And then you need a way of tracking. Now, what do you track? You can track your 
your VOC listening, your NPS and other scores. And if you use, for example, the XID in Qualtrics, you can actually start tracking your insights against a persona. If you map your customers to your personas, you can also do things like if I, if I do versions of a website or versions of a campaign where I have a certain design target in mind for particular personas, you can start experimenting and seeing whether a particular campaign or change to an experience delivers a better result for your target persona. And what, which is really fascinating about this is that there's actually three types of insights, primary research, ongoing listening as part of your customer listening and experimentation and companies reinvent the wheel. They keep doing more and more primary research. But I've actually found with clients that you can save 30 to 50% of your research spend if you get better at the other two. If you get better at customer listening, you get better about experimentation, not only do you get faster, better, cheaper insights, but you can save. And now in a, in a bank or a apparel company or something like that, that could be 5 to $15 million a year they're saving in research and testing, which pays for all your other investments. So I would hypot. I love your three layers there, by the way. I would hypothesize, perhaps, that a reason why people keep going back to primary research is they have difficulty doing the other two layers, or at mm. least doing the other two layers in a repeatable, actionable way, which is what those require. Listening yeah, is a building, continuous. You're building muscle in the organization. Back yeah. to that point, right? It's it's much easier to make the commitment through primary research. Okay, we're going to go to the gym, and we're going to find out what needs to be uh, you know, worked on. That's the primary research. What's the listening? What are we learning? How are people responding to us when they're coming to the site or, you know, interacting with us or we see them out there in the ether? So I absolutely agree. And I love those three layers. I think they make perfect sense. I, I don't think it's easy for most organizations, though. particularly the larger the organization gets. You would think, well, larger organizations they have more data and they do. But those things could be a handicap. You know, sometimes smaller is easier you know, to get started and to really begin driving what you're really describing here is a change management approach to how we manage our customers and experience. hundred percent. And and for me, that's, this is why I, um, I spent so much time when I was at PwC and uh, booze before that with the Katzenbach Center for Culture and Change Leadership, because I really believe that you can't, drive impact without focusing not only on change management, but culture, you know, and that's why my book is called the CX and culture connection and why this podcast is called the CX and culture connection, because I think that th this focusing on the culture is actually what makes you successful or fail. Was it a uh, Peter Drucker who, who is quoted for saying culture eats strategy for breakfast? Yes. Yeah. Although he didn't actually say that. I think what he said is culture is per, is something pervasive and it was a really convoluted sentence. So people instead say he, the other quote, culture eats strategy for best. It's easier to remember. Yeah. I heard that from the same CMO who said, um, glass buildings don't buy software. People do. And, you know, both pieces of advice that I've put in my pocket here and I take with me because I do think they're so, uh, they're so spot on and more important than ever in many ways. Yeah. So for the, the audience, like, you know, what a lot of people will do is um, say, hey, let's have a keynote speaker come in and, and motivate people and or let's do a study. And this is why a lot of consulting projects fail is that you, you study the problem and you engage, but there's no clear path to drive change in the organization and not enough attention is paid to how this is going to drive change in a way that gets the people of the organization involved to make the change successful. So half of efforts fail because not enough attention is paid to change in culture. So if, you know, Ken and I could come in and speak, but what would have much more impact is to collaborate on helping your people change their approach to insights, not just talk about the importance of doing that. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a super point, Matt, because no one needs a report they're going to save on the shelf. And I guess they get to check the box that, oh, yeah, we had, uh, you know, we had Matt come in. He, he spoke to us and he told us these things. 
how do you get it into the business? How do you get people working on this? How do you, for a business, and you and I both believe that customer experience is a core capability for a business, something essential. You need to bring your people to bear on it. You need to get them moving. Now, that sounds daunting, right? And one of the questions I always get on analytics when I speak to companies is, you know, particularly smaller companies maybe or, you know, mid-sized companies is, Ken, we just don't know where to start. How do we get started, right? And the answer is, let's pick one opportunity and let's, let's demonstrate the process. Let's show how this works. Let's get the people involved because then they become the champions and they start the flywheel. So, you know, earlier in the podcast, I mentioned, you know, your um, involvement at Babson, which is the number one school for entrepreneurs. Do you have any insights to share for how CX and insights can be taken advantage of at emerging companies, given your involvement in the entrepreneurial space? So often people say, you know, we're not pick your favorite big company, or in the case of the Boston area, Fidelity Investments or EMC or whatever. You know, how do you know this? This isn't for us. We don't need to do this. And I'm just starting something out. I, I'm starting a new venture and I have some seed money. And the answer is. This is the perfect time to think about it. Build this thinking into your business, the CX thinking. Think about data as you're creating your systems over here from the perspective of how I'm going to use that data for analytics, right? How I'm going to use that to understand. And you're not going to, it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to know all the answers day one, but you need to build with those ideas in place. That customer experience is going to be essential. So as I build this business, I need to be attracting certain types of people. I need to be buying certain types of um, enablers later and so on. But you need to build with these thoughts in mind. And I do see they go hand in hand, the analytics enabling. And I, by the way, on, on CX, just a general comment, um, certainly I, I, I am totally where you are with CX, but I don't think the, the world necessarily is. People see CX as its own thing and they put it over here and maybe the marketing group does it. CX is across the business and is all encompassing. It's how you do everything. It, it even ties to your supply chain. And this would always be an eye opener when I spoke to some customers at AWS. When I'd say, okay, it's not just about how we interact with them. It's like, well, how that ultimately feeds into what we're going to put into our supply chain in order to meet demands, et cetera, It affects et cetera. ease of doing business and transparency exactly. and trust. So to entrepreneurs, the idea is... You need to build with these principles in mind. You want to be a CX company. And by that, I don't mean CX in the term of enablers. I'm in, in terms of mindset. And you need to be an, an insight-driven company in terms of mindset. So build from there. I agree 100%. And, and for the entrepreneurs in the audience, um, you know, a lot of times you'll be focusing on product market fit. And how do you build the insights and under assessment of product market fit? And once you have that and you get additional money, you're going to hyperscale. Now, where this is particularly relevant is at that moment where you're looking to scale because you want to make sure that what you're doing is going to scale well and build the muscle and the culture in a way that it will be positioning you for success into the future. Because what happens with a lot of companies is they build up bad habits and they build up bad organizational practices as they scale. It's, it, they can overcome it through strong leadership when they're smaller. It's a lot less complex. But make sure that your customer experience approach and the muscle you're building and the culture is going to be successful as you scale, and then you won't have to fix it later. So that's exactly the right time to make sure you've got this right is when you're going into hyperscale. I remember um, in my consulting days working with a large financial services company. And the, uh, the CMO said, why is it that these other companies can get to analytics and insight faster than us? Why can they just do these things and we can't? And I said something akin to what you just said, Matt, which is, you know, you're an older organization, you have older technology, and more importantly, you've built a bunch of bad habits in terms of how you handle your data, how you think about it. Um, every time somebody wants to use something, you have these layers of 
of um, of processes and 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 approvals. Not that those aren't needed, but this has been the accumulation of these things over years. Whereas a new entrant into the market, because they were having their lunch eaten by new entrants, they come in, they're not inhibited by any of that. And they're moving quick. And to your point, they're getting to a point of they get their product market fix right. Now they're ready to scale. And they're set up to uh, to really spin that flywheel a lot faster. Ken, I really enjoyed our conversation. It's definitely um, sparked some great ideas for me. I, I know it has for the audience, too. If folks want to get in touch with you and continue the conversation, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, I'm out there on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn where a copy of this podcast will be sitting as well. Um, and we can uh, we could chat. We could chat with Matt. We could chat with me. Very happy. Always excited to hear about what people are doing, how they're trying to do things, how we can help. It's, uh, it's always a great discussion. Thanks so much, Ken, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>